Hello and welcome again to North Central Journal. I'm Scott May and we have a very special show for you uh, this month. We're going to focus on Freemasonry and I'm pleased to have three members of Aurora Lodge of Fitchburg uh, with me this evening uh, beginning with Michael Trotter who's the uh, Worshipful Master of Aurora Lodge therefore he's the most well-dressed of the uh, four of us. <laughs> we have uh, the Senior Warden David Gordon and the secretary and former Worshipful Master of Aurora Lodge, Christopher Murray. And gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And uh, we just want to shed a little light on what Freemasonry is, a little more light on Aurora Lodge of Fitchburg, because uh, I understand there's an anniversary coming up for the Lodge. Uh, I have to admit that I've been a member of Aurora Lodge for quite a while, too, so it's uh, um, something near and dear to me, and I, I thought this might be an interesting show for folks who may have some preconceived notions about masonry, and maybe we can shed a little more light on it. And uh, David, I want to begin with you. What, what is the origin of Freemasonry? How did, it, how did it begin? Well, formally, it uh, began in England, 1713, and <clears throat> became um, fairly well established and ended up spreading to New England, particularly Massachusetts, about 1733. And that's, that's what the records show. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of thought that's not particularly supported by documented fact, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to support the idea that some of the origins of the organization may have originated with the Knights Templar uh, at, towards the end of the Crusades. So that type of, a, of an organization has been in existence for a number of centuries, mm -hmm. not in the format that we recognize Masons in today, which is only a couple hundred years, but uh, the precepts and the, and the thoughts uh, that embody it had been in existence for quite some time. Now, masonry, um, we learned that there's operative masonry and speculative masonry as members of uh, the fraternity. What is the difference between the two? Does anybody know? <laughs> I would say that an operative mason is someone who works in the tree, right. is out in the field working with stone, building buildings as simple as stone walls to beautiful cathedrals. And a lot of the guilds from those early builders uh, before the spoken word and before written words, uh, they formed into bands with the, the masons and y you had different levels of your apprenticeship uh, so that's where they got different names and the speculative masons are us mm -hmm. we call ourselves masons but we're not working in a trade but one of the symbols that people are most familiar with is the square and compass which is a symbol of masonry and they are the tools of operative masons. Absolutely. And those tools uh, in speculative masonry or Freemasonry, uh, we use them as symbols to uh, remind ourselves and to instruct new masons of what our teachings are, uh, what our, our goals are in life, and how we want to live our lives. Michael, what is the purpose of Freemasonry? What's the foundation? The foundation is to help grow good men to be better. Uh, you have to, just like with cooking, you have to start with good material. So we start with good men who want to improve themselves, uh, both for their family, uh, in their community. Uh, there's a lot of things through the, through the tools that you mentioned, uh, their precepts for the types of foundation or pillars that we need and everyone uh, as human beings in society need to have. 
and we take that and as an organization uh, uh, how you how you see that maybe not always publicly is in our our works with charity in the local uh, uh, local community. Yeah, we're going to get into that discussion about the charitable organization that Masonry is, but I want to ask, um, and this is I think a misconception in a lot of people: is Masonry a religion? It is not a religion. Uh, in Masonry, you have people of all faiths and all beliefs. Uh, our only requirement is that you believe in a higher power. Uh, but you're going to find in, in Masonry people from all walks of life and faiths. The other, the other thing that I think people dwell on a bit are the secrets. What are Masonic secrets? Are there secrets? <laughs> The Masonic secrets are ways that we learn to communicate between ourselves so we can recognize each other. Uh, it may be a handshake, mm -hmm. maybe a gesture, something along that line, or, or a spoken word mm -hmm. where one Mason can recognize another. Yep. Uh, and it's also, uh, you can be used uh, if one person, if, if a Mason's in distress, you, you can you can signal other Masons who may be within range of your signal that you you are you are in distress mm -hmm. and you're, you're asking for help, and that's part of our that's that's part of our organization is to be there for each other. It's a big part of our organization, actually. If I may add to that, to bring it to, to modern times, or current uh, environment, uh, our secrets are a little bit like the antivirus or spam that you have on your computer when someone reaches out to you for something. How do you know it's the person you think it is on the other side? And so that kind of helps protect us as an organization that when someone reaches out, we know uh, we recognize them mm -hmm. as someone who is part of the fraternity. And, and it validates we need to reach out and help that person. Who are some of the more notable Freemasons? I mean, stars of masonry, names that everybody would recognize. Let's run down a list here. I'll begin with Paul Revere. Anybody else can jump in. <laughs> Who else? George Washington. Uh -huh. Benjamin Franklin. There were a number of presidents yes. besides yeah. George Washington. There were 14 presidents that were master masons. Um, and starting with George Washington and then ending with Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. um, and where there's only been 45, 46 presidents, that's a pretty good percentage of presidents. Yeah, both Roosevelt's that, were masons, correct. were they not? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Bill Clinton wasn't a Mason, but he was in one of the youth organizations in D. Uh -huh. uh, so it's a it's a way of public service, of learning. It's a fraternity, so people start in those fraternities. The, uh, there's Boys State that the American Legion does to get youngsters into politics and things like that. So the youth groups can lead to masonry. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of movie stars that have been uh, uh, masons. Uh, Ronald Reagan was made an honorary mason. Oh, he was. Uh, he never went through the degrees. Uh, How does one become a mason? Other than being an honorary mason, what are the steps how do you get there? And then what do you have to do to become a full-fledged master mason? The first thing you have to do is ask. That's, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. You ask a mason, I'd like to learn more about masonry. And there was a time when a father couldn't ask his son, the son had to ask the father. And that wasn't the smartest thing. It, it left a lot of potential men out. Uh, now, 
we're allowed to ask. If you know someone who might be a, a good candidate to be a Mason, you can ask them, hey, if you ever want to learn more about Masonry, just ask me. So they ask. And at Aurora, we bring people into the lodge. We want you to meet the brothers that hang out there and associate there and see if you'd like to, if you like those people. And if you do, you fill out an application um, and attest that you have a belief in a supreme being. At that point, we would have an investigating committee meet with you. Mm -hmm. um, you we conduct a background check in Massachusetts, um, similar to a Cory check, uh, to make sure that you're a worthy person, and then the lodge votes on you. And the investigating committee when you meet with them, it's, it's like a, a character interview. I mean, it, it really is an interview. That's what it, it comes It really down is to. an interview. Yeah. Yeah. We, no, we want to do it at your home yep. with your spouse and your family. And we want to make sure that you're right for us, but we also want to make for that, sure that we're right for you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an effort. There's a cost to it. So it, it's... It has to be something that's done carefully and slowly. It takes three or four months to really get things started because it's important. And short of showing, short of knowing someone who's a Mason and asking, yep. uh, in today's world, you can go on the internet. You can send a request online to either the local lodge that you may be aware of or to the Grand Lodge in, in Boston, uh, in our now, case. You mentioned, Chris, uh, not being able to talk to your father. When I became a Mason, um, my dad was a Mason. My mother came to me and said, you know, you'd make your dad awfully proud if you became a Mason. He never approached me, my mother did. <laughs> and then I went and asked my dad about it. And that's how that worked. And that was 50 years ago. Well, it's a good thing there's women around. <laughs> we get a lot more done. <laughs> Michael, you mentioned Grand Lodge, and I wanted to touch on that because that's a term a lot of people would not be familiar with. What is Grand Lodge? That's a, uh, uh, we all may have a little bit different perspective, but they're the, they're the uh, top jurisdiction, uh, uh, either at the state or country level, that actually issues charters for the local uh, lodges. Mm -hmm. uh, they set the uh, uh, the bylaws and how you're going to operate, uh, but they're a, they're a governing body. The uh, only thing I could maybe relate that to is the uh, the Red Cross. They're going to have a national top level corporate organization, mm -hmm. but it's really the local chapters that operate, but they have to have a framework and a set of uh, bylaws to operate by. Now, is there a Grand Lodge? I know there's one in Boston. Is there one in every state? Or is there almost. one? Almost. Almost every state, yeah? Almost. So each state has its own Grand Lodge, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. And are, are there differences between the states in terms of how the Grand Lodges operate? State yes. to state? There yes. are. Just like you'll find a little bit of differences even at the local lodge level. And I'm going to go back to a little bit of something that Christopher said a few moments ago where we like to meet or have the person who's interested come in and meet the brothers of that lodge even though we're all operating by the same principles the organization is made up of people and you have to like or like being around the people that are in that organization and if it's not that lodge they're uh, here in the Fitchburg uh, area uh, we have two uh, not just Aurora Lodge, uh, C.W. Mm -hmm. Moore Lodge. Mm -hmm. Different set of brothers. We're doing a lot of the same work. It's just a different set of people. Mm -hmm. it, and actually, oh, go ahead. It's just saying the personality mixes are a little bit different from lodge to lodge. Sure, yeah. So they all have their own little character. And you may know, you may have more people that you're friends with or familiar with in a particular right. lodge, and that's probably where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in this area, you mentioned two lodges in Fitchburg, but what people don't know, there's one in Levister, there's one in Gardner, there's Littleton, there's Ayr. There are lodges all over the place here in central Massachusetts. In 
in Wichita. I think there's a lodge up there, there right? Is. Yeah. So, um, if people are interested, basically the community you're in or one next door is probably going to have uh, a lodge that you can look into. Right. Correct. Yeah. Here's a personal question for all of you, and I'll start with you, Michael. Why did you become a Mason? As you can tell from my accent, I'm not from the Boston area originally. <laughs> uh, I've actually lived uh, all over the all over the world, more than 20 years in Asia, and w we moved up here about seven years ago. And I was working all the time, and my uh, my wife actually uh, encouraged me to go check the Masons out to have an organization to implore some of my capabilities and, and talents in outside of work. And uh, kind of the rest is history. It's been uh, a little over four years now, and uh, it's, it's been a fun, uh, fun, fun journey. Did you have any friends or relatives that were in the fraternity? I did not. You didn't? Uh, it was actually uh, one of the brothers from a Royal Lodge who uh, was doing some contract work for Home Depot. It stopped by the house. And that's how, even though I don't live in Pittsburgh, I live in Bolton, that's how I ended up being, coming associated with uh, Aurora Lodge. Uh -huh. I came, visited, uh, I liked the personalities and the people, and uh, here I am. David? <clears throat> my stat was similar to yours. My father had been a Mason. He never spoke to me about joining or what Masonry was about, never mentioned it to me. He had not joined Masonry until after I was away at college. So he and I really never had a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk about it. Now I graduated from college and I moved on. Um, and I had friends in New Hampshire who actually introduced me to Masonry. Uh -huh. and, it was, and unfortunately, it was after my father had passed away. But. Uh, I have found it an extremely rewarding experience. I've been a Mason now for 16 years, and the only regret I have is I never had an opportunity to talk with my father about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, I, it's it's a good experience. It really is. It um, gives you a lot of opportunity for self-reflection. I like that. Christopher, let's hear your story. We have plenty of time. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, I had a, a career change, and I had my evenings free. My children were grown, and I had time. So a, a friend of mine uh, mentioned to me at an event, he goes, hey, if you're interested in learning more about masonry, come ask. Um, and, and I did, and what I found was an opportunity for me to step out of my comfort zone, stand up in front of people and talk, to do some acting, to find a need for some talents and abilities in our building maintenance and helping uh, other brothers and learning some new skills um, and that I was hooked from the get-go we I went through the degrees and we took a trip to Washington DC and that's where they sunk the hook um, <laughs> and I they gave me opportunities to try some new things and that was what did it for me to travel with a group of men that I didn't know well, but after that trip, I did. And, and masonry is one of those things that you get out of it what you put into it. Right. And we try to explain that to new people. It's not just about coming to the meeting and going home, but do things with people, travel, go to other lodges, go to other states. Use some of those secret modes of recognition and work your way into a lodge in Philadelphia or Washington and meet some other brothers. And it's kind of like 
you know them already. When you meet other brothers, you walk into a lodge and you know that they're like-minded people and the doors are wide open. You can have conversations and leave feeling like you've known them for a long time. So that was my story and I try to impart that on other people is come join us. We're a fraternity. But you get out of it what you put into it and if you want to get something back then you got to put a little bit of yourself into mm -hmm. it. Tell us about some of the other <clears throat> Masonic organizations other than Masonry, Freemasonry. Um, you mentioned the Malay. Um, Rainbow. Let's talk right. about some of those organizations and how they're connected. Well, the D Malay and, uh, and uh, for the uh, for the boys and Rainbow for the girls. Mm -hmm. uh, those organizations to start teaching uh, pr principles uh, that we have in, in masonry, but it, it's about uh, helping them to grow into uh, functioning. And, and positively, positively contributing adults into society. Whether or not they choose to go on uh, into masonry or not, they're, they're just good skills to have. In and your, those two organizations, life. DMLA and Rainbow, are for younger people. They are for younger right? people, yeah. correct. And many do, uh, many of the DMLAs do go on to become uh, masons, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, many do not. It's not a requirement. Um, you're probably the most public uh, organization that most uh, people will relate to are the Shriners. Sure. Because they're at the parades, they drive the funny cars <laughs> and wear the funny hats. Uh, most of the masonry happens in the background because it's not about the recognition. There's a lot of charity that's done that you may or may not know even comes from the Masons. And that's by design. Well, we want to talk about that though. Okay. The Shriners, we were talking about it before we started uh, the, the show, Shriners Hospitals for Children. And Tremendous work. Masonry is connected to that in a big, big way. Talk about that and then some of the other organizations that maybe people have heard of or some of the things that Aurora Lodge is doing locally. Uh, well, one thing that most people may not realize is that all Shriners are Masons. Mm -hmm. You have to be a Mason before you can apply to become part of the Shriner organization. Right. Uh, and all lodges at, at, at some level help support our Shriners. Uh, the, the work they do with the children is just incredible. Uh, David, Christopher. Uh, another organization that's not as well known as the Shriners is <clears throat> Scottish Right. Yep. Um, they do a lot of work with uh, establishing funding schools for dyslexic children. People don't understand or probably don't know of it. It's not, it's, they're not as well known as the burn centers are. But they do, they do extremely good work and it's work that's needed. And they really affect the lives of a lot of children. Mm -hmm. They, and there's Scottish Right has a uh, dyslexic center in New Hampshire. That's one of the closest ones here. Uh, Christopher, you, uh, Aurora Lodge, just had a golf tournament. As we're into uh, the fall now with this show, and, and the golf tournament was in August, is that correct? Correct. And that was a charitable event as well, wasn't it? it? It's all the money, the proceeds from that go to local charities. Uh, one of the things we do locally is we partner with Longstreet Middle School and assist them. If our contact there reaches out to us when they have a need and we fulfill it. Uh, and other lodges do that also. It's called the Angel Fund. Uh -huh, yep. uh, there's no red tape. There's no, we don't go through the superintendent or the principal. It's just done whether a child needs a jacket or do we help pay for a field trip or someone needs a new pair of glasses. When the school asks us, we deliver it and that's where those charity money goes. Um, in, in, in that work, no one ever hears about. 
Yeah. And it's designed. I wasn't designed. Even aware of that. Yeah. It's designed that yeah. way. It's not about look at me. It's about take care of the need. There's terrible fires and people lose everything, whether it's at Monty Tech or in Lunenburg. And if someone reaches out and we have the funds, we help them uh, quickly. It's not an application and wait six weeks. It's done. Within 24 hours of the request. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which is nice. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to touch on the anniversary of Aurora Lodge coming up. When was Aurora Lodge chartered? So in on June 8th, 1801, Aurora Lodge was chartered in Leominster. And they had their first meeting on July 9th in Leominster. And then... Where was the, where was the meeting? It was Kendall, at a, Kendall, a place called Kendall Tavern. Yes. Uh, which is still there. Yep. It's at 746 West Street in Leominster. And it's a private residence now. Uh, but the lodge room is still set up on the third floor. Mm -hmm. We were there uh, back in June, uh, which was a wonderful. The owner of the home is is very open to the Masons and helpful. Uh, but we moved to Fitchburg in 1844. 44. Uh, yep. We're on Main Street uh, for a number of years. I remember that, yeah. And moved to our current location in 1964 uh, where we have a beautiful building. And it's uh, one of the few Masonic halls that was actually built as a Masonic hall. Most are in churches or doctor's offices or private residences. And you share that with uh, Charles W. Moore Lodge, the we, second Masonic Lodge in Fitchburg. We yes. do. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Michael, where can people go as we wind down here if someone is really interested in knowing more about masonry, knowing more about Aurora Lodge? How do they go about doing that? Uh, they can reach out to us via our website, uh, auroralodge.com uh, in Pittsburgh, if you Google it, or you can go to the Grand Lodge uh, in Boston uh, and or uh, stop by on one of our Monday evenings uh, most Monday evenings we have a uh, a uh, social night. A social night that's that's open for people to come visit and check uh -huh. us out. Well, and that's good to know too. So if it's not a formal meeting, you have an open invitation to folks. Yes. yes. Yeah. I really appreciate the three of you being here. Certainly respect everything you do, having uh, been down that path um, in my family and uh, a few years myself. And I just want to say thank you and I, I hope that this has enlightened a few people and maybe will inspire a few people to uh, look into masonry and and maybe uh, find a fit. Thank you for having us, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.